here. Juanita's been having some issues, and we're praying for you. And our our sister uh, Rita Moore is in the hospital over in Las Vegas. Uh, she and Kelly went over there for a vacation, and uh, she developed some problems that are being addressed right now. The latest word we had is that they've given her tests, and the tests are clear, so praise God. But we need to be praying for her. We'll pray for her right now. Uh, she has diabetes. She's a brittle diabetic. Uh, terrible disease. Very difficult to manage. Um, she's got some other issues. She's a kidney transplant patient. So you can understand that her health is in constant balance and prayer is much appreciated. So let's pray for Rita. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we lift up our sister Rita Moore and Kelly as they're in Las Vegas. May your kindness and mercy be upon them. Thank you, dear Lord, that even now you're bringing Healy to Rita and strengthening her, and we pray that she and Kelly can soon come home and they will be strong and vital, and that, dear Lord, your kindness and mercy would be upon them. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, you, you might take your bulletin. I know you, if you have a pen or pencil, I want you to do something. And if you don't have a pen or pencil, don't worry about it. You can just do it mentally. But take your bulletin. And on that first page, after pulpit greeter, Betty Wagner, by the way, Betty, wherever you are, <laughs> she did a great job this morning. <laughs> but where it says the Bible, above that, write thy word. Above the Bible, write thy word. Uh, we're celebrating the year of the Bible. And last week, we heard some Bible facts and history that make this book stand out. The contention among men over the Bible as to be God's book is not going to go away. However, as Christians, our belief in the Bible is reinforced by our belief in Jesus Christ. Jesus is called the Word. Last week, we looked at facts about the Bible, about its importance in our life. Today, we consider the Word of God which came before any written page. And I reminded us last week of these key scriptures. John 1.1, 1, 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And, and those verses are amplified in the first chapter by verse 14 which says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And if that wasn't enough, in verse 18 we read, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten God, who is in the bosom of the Father, has explained Him. So, when God created with his world and brought forth everything that we see in this hard copy reality that we live in, he was creating through the Word. And my Bible says that the Word is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ explains God. And a lot of people say, well, if I could only see God, Tom, Thomas said that. Philip said that. If I could only see God, then, then we'd know that you're, you're the Messiah. And he said to him, hey, you've seen me. You've seen the Father. But it's hard for us to get this. And you know, our, our image of the Lord Jesus Christ varies from person to person and culture to culture. We've had innumerable paintings by artists of what Jesus looked like. The one I grew up with on our wall in my home was Solomon's head of Christ. You know, that brown kind of image and long hair and uh, dark complexion. And now in our home, we have uh, 
Annalie Carmackfoss picture of Jesus, who's more ruddy and like a carpenter, and and that seems to suit her. In in the hallway in our church, we have renditions or pictures of Jesus. There's one in the nursery. You might take a look in there before you leave today. There's another rendition of Jesus. Nevertheless, the Bible says he's the Word of God. So when we open this Bible and we read the Word of God, Jesus is becoming real to us. He's being pictured to us. And so as we move into this year of the Bible, we're moving into a renewed time of relationship with Jesus Christ. And these verses are powerful in the prologue to John. Jesus takes his person and the very word of God even farther than this. And this is what Jesus says in John chapter 15. In John chapter 15, he says in verse 4, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it is, abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. Abide in Jesus, the word of God. And, and then he emphasizes even more when he says in verse 7, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. How can this be? Because God created with the word. Now I understand the significance of these Bible verses. Our culture is in the habit of thinking what was before God. But, but even more profound in believing that there is a God is the question, what was between God and the creation? His word. God said, and it was so. The Bible is clear. Before the creation, before the hard rock reality that we know around us, before life itself, there was the Word. The Bible tells us that in the beginning, God created with that Word. God spoke everything into existence. How can we capture this in our lives? Maybe you've had the experience in your life of saying something that either bless somebody or curse somebody. Words have power. When we speak them to somebody, we can cause them pain or we can cause them joy. We're created in the image of God. And when we speak, language and words have meaning and purpose because they come from God. And when God speaks, it has meaning and purpose. So when I say to you that Jesus Christ is the spoken word of God, Receive that. Take it in. When we study the Bible, take the word internally because it changes us. It transforms us. And we begin to live the life of Jesus Christ, who was good, truthful, forthright, and loving, and kind. You know all of this. That's the nature of the word, the living word. Let us get things straight here. The Word came before the Bible. Let me say that in a different way. Before any words in any language were credited to God on the written page, God's words existed. Now, this may be hard for us to understand, but in a sense, there's a tremendous parallel with contemporary physics, what they call quantum physics, the physics of small things. Because there are laws that govern all this, aren't there? And these laws function. And our scientific community and even us, when we drive these vehicles out here, depend upon these laws. We don't have to see them written down. We know they're there. If you drive too fast and you hit an object, the inertia is going to do serious damage to you. That's a law of physics for every action and opposite. There's an opposite reaction. These laws are in place. It's almost as if the words already exist. And that's the nature of God's word. The words are there. They're in place. And when we follow them and believe them, then we can 
live a life that's filled with hope and peace and well-being. You see, God's revelation to the biblical characters, to Abraham, to Moses, to Daniel, to David, to Jeremiah and Isaiah, to the gospel writers, to Paul, was received personally. Please understand that. Before any of these men wrote down one inspired word from God, they received his word in Revelation. Have you received his word in Revelation? God speaking to you in that still small voice? Have you been listening? The word in Greek is logos. And I'm not trying to give you a Greek lesson, but the word logos is much more in Greek than it is in English. Because in Greek, the word is used to stand for the reason why. Yeah, logos means the reason why. And when you think about all our sciences, all of our sciences are ended in the logos. It's a variation, but it's still there. You have biology, psychology, geology, you get the picture. Well, the ology in the original Greek is telling us the reason why. Bios, life, ology, why is there life? The reason for it. Theology, God, the reason for it. Uh, zoology, again, life, the reason for it. Astronomy, and all of these different ologies, they come to us from the Greek Logos. Now, why should this concern us? Because you see, the, the divine Logos of God is, is the principle of creation itself. And we may fashion it into words that help us understand our sciences or whatever we do. But finally, for us personally, it means God in you. The reason why. God in you. The hope of glory. That's what the evangelist says. And when you get God in you, when you get the word down in you, then things begin to change and wonderful things take place. Jesus is the divine Logos. Even before there was a Bible, God's word was active. So we read in the Colossian letter, this is what we read. And he is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. In case you didn't get it, Jesus is the reason why. And if, if we want to know why, we need to listen to the divine logos. But sadly, we don't listen real well. When we do, we discount it as our imagination. Take care, believer. God is talking to us in this word that I hold in my hand. He's talking to us in our prayers and in our dreams. God is with us. In the 13th chapter of Matthew, Jesus says this, Therefore I speak to them in parables, because while seeing, they do not see. And while hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. In their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, and Jesus quotes Isaiah, you will keep on hearing, but will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but you will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull, with their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they would see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts 
and return, and I would heal them. It's not that we're trying to make God's people feel guilty or bad. It's just to keep us alert to the fact that the word of God is there. It was spoken to the prophets of old. It is being spoken to us. Whether you open this Bible and you receive that word, or you dream and have the word, or you pray and have the word, it's there. Paul talks to the Romans and in the, to the Romans, he says very simply, the word is near you, in your mouth. Let me read it to you. The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, mouth he confesses resulting in salvation. The scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. Can you be saved without the Bible? Yes. All it takes is a witness to come to you and testify to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Spirit of God works the miracle. That's what's happened on the mission field for 20 centuries. Remember, when they first went out and they began to witness after Pentecost, they didn't have a Bible like us. They had the Old Testament scrolls, but I can't picture those disciples packing around a bunch of scrolls so that they could open it and testify to somebody. No, what they did is they testified to the word of God which was given to them. They said, we are witnesses of these things. So are you a witness to the spirit of God in you, to the words that are there? You know, when we go and minister in the jail, we use a card, and we have scriptures on that card. And it's great because we can share these scriptures, and we'll open the Bible that we have, and sometimes we'll share other scriptures, etc. But the most important thing that happens there is that we give our testimony, and we speak words of life that Jesus gave to us, and that's what those inmates hear. Yes. Thank God for the English Bible. Thank God that he gave us the printed word that we can have it with us. And now we can have, have that word spoken on an iPod that we can slip in our pocket and put the earbuds in our ears. But more than that, the word is living, alive in us. And when we testify to somebody and we speak that word to them, God is in those words. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. And the person we're witnessing to say, I didn't know that. We don't have to open the Bible. We don't have to carry it with us because the living word of God in Christ is in us. Now some people will say, well, gee, I, you know, I don't know the Bible that well. <clears throat> I'll never forget seeing Richard Burton on Johnny Carson's years ago. All you younger people can excuse it. But Richard Burton was a famous actor, and uh, they, he was having conversation with Johnny Carson, and, and uh, in the conversation, Richard Burton says, I know the Bible. You do? Oh, yeah. Yeah, my dad made me memorize this passages from the Bible. And Johnny Carson, being Johnny Carson, said, well, Let's hear something. Richard Burton quoted two chapters from the book of 1 Kings verbatim. But even though he read the Bible and he could speak the words, he wasn't saved. See, you've got to get it inside of you. Speak with the mouth. We believe with the heart. These things have to be in us. This is the living word of God. This is the challenge to us. Dr. Michael Kruger, who I don't expect you to know, is a professor of New Testament at Reformed Theological Seminary in North Carolina. 
he summarized it pretty well. If we believe the Bible, we will believe in Jesus. But it is also true that if we believe in Jesus, we will believe the Bible. Let that sink in for a minute. You see, when we put too much emphasis on the Bible and not enough on the Word, we make the Bible into an icon of faith and we idolize it. Paul writes to the Romans, what we read, the word is near to you, in your mouth and in your heart. That's what makes the difference. Remember, we are all evangelists when we come to Jesus Christ, and we're speaking the word to others, and we're giving them cause to reflect on what God has already put in their lives. But don't misunderstand. We're not in any way, form, saying to you, you don't need a Bible. What we're saying is that the word on this page takes life as the word in your heart and in your mind, and that's where it needs to be. And that's what we celebrate in the year of the Bible. We celebrate our Christianity, and we celebrate the fact that the word is alive in us. So the question is then, how does one come to saving faith? It's by believing in the word, Jesus Christ. The power of words does not need to be depreciated. We have a great power in the word that has been given to us to change lives for the better. Because like the evangelist said in Romans, the word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. The question for us as we celebrate the year of the Bible is, do you have the word in you? Maybe it's time to begin to seriously think about remembering some Bible verses. Maybe it's time to begin to think about not just reading the Bible during the day, but letting it sink in. To read some of the parables of Jesus, you don't have to repeat them in the words that they appear on the written page, but at least when you talk about the Good Samaritan to somebody you're witnessing to, you can share the fact that the Good Samaritan cared about others and gave to their needs and well-being, and the religious hypocrites passed by on the other side. Yes, we can repeat the word became flesh. And that's a powerful passage because when I read it to you the last time, <clears throat> maybe you did not hear what the end of that verse says. We saw his glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word is the glory of Jesus Christ, and the Word is full of grace and truth. Now, you know you can go and take any commentary, or you can go on the Internet, and they will say, well, what this means is, that first of all, grace is God's mercy. I agree with that. And then they will say that the truth is a redeeming act of Christ, and that's good. But it seems to me that although grace is certainly God's mercy, truth, on the other hand, is God's divine word, his will given in commandments. What did Moses come down from Mount Sinai with? The will of God. Two tablets and the Ten Commandments. The greatest of these commandments is to be born again in Christ Jesus. So we have the word Jesus Christ whose atoning act glorifies the Father and brings unmerited favor to man. Hallelujah! 
And we have faith, which is given in commandments that show us God's divine will, which is perfected in Christ. And we remember that Jesus said he is the way, the truth, and the life. And the way Jesus understood that is the Torah, the five books of God. And what the word Torah can mean is the way the stone is cast. Now, I don't know the last time you threw a stone, or maybe you threw a ball or something. It doesn't go out and zigzag. It takes a straight line. The commandments and statues of God take a straight line. They are the way. And they also are the truth. Because you see, if we want to know what God wants, it's been written down for us. You say, well, I don't know what the will of God is for me. Take one place, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, in all things give thanks, for this is the will of God for you. So we have the word, Jesus Christ, whose atoning act glorifies the Father and brings on merit and favor to us. And we have God's statutes and his commandments given to us. And I'm not saying that, dear brothers and sisters, we have to be obedient to the commandments and do works of righteousness. I'm saying that if we're in Christ and we receive the word, then the truth of that word, as Jesus said, is what God has told us to do. Remember the great commandment that Jesus gave, a new commandment, that you love one another even as I have loved you. That's a toughie. It begins at home and it radiates out to work, to our churches, to our businesses, and to our culture. God is not lax in telling us the truth. And then Jesus tells us in that passage that he is the life. Okay, what is life? What is bios or zoe? Life is that force within us given by God that gives us breath and purpose, that gives us thought and direction. But life can be lived in two ways. It can be lived as the world and not caring what God says, or it can be lived in the life and breath of the world, Jesus Christ the way, the truth, and the life. And that life is going to be self-giving, helpful, merciful, understanding. We know this. We've heard it. We need to apply it. Let, let the year of the Bible be the year that we take the book, the Bible, and read it. And the year that we take the word given to us, and take it internally to our hearts and our minds. And that we begin to speak and live that which Jesus taught us to do. Now, I, I understand how the world is. It's tooth and nail. I know that. And I know we're going to meet conflict and we're going to have to make decisions that are not always pleasant for us. But the point is, who are we putting first? Me? You? For Almighty God. If we put God's first, then let's do it His way. The way the stone is cast, without variation, without zigzags, let's do it His way. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a graven image, nor worship them. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, and on and on and on. Why were these given to us? Because this is the truth. We cry out for truth. The Greeks cried out for truth. That's what all Greek philosophy is about. And if you ever take a course in college and you study Greek philosophy, you're going to have them searching for the truth. What is the truth? Pilate asked Jesus that. He had the truth standing right in front of him. And Jesus told him he stands for the truth. And Pilate goes, ha! What is the truth? That's how deaf and blind our culture is. We need to get our eyes open and our ears open, and we need to take the word internally that we receive, because in that word, there's power. We all want power to overcome our defeats and our problems. You want power? Then be in the word. 
Jesus is the divine Logos, the Word of God. And in my Bible, the treasury of the Word is there. In Psalm 119, we read these things. How blessed are those who walk in the law of the Lord. Verse 1. Revive me according to thy word. Teach me thy statutes. Verse 25. Give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. Verse 73. I wait for thy word. Verse 81. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Verse 105. I learned that verse in Sunday school as a boy. Oh, and by the way, the B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E, Bible. I sang that in Sunday school as a boy. And we get older and we move away from these things and we begin to forget the word that has been given to us. And we get so involved in life that we forget about the truth that we have. Oh, how we suffer. The Bible is very clear. It says the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. That's what my Bible says. It is a sharp two-edged sword that cuts through all of the baloney and gets down to the truth. Getting God's word in us is the devout enterprise of the year of the Bible. It is to our benefit that we do this, yet as has been the result down through Christian history, when you take the word internally, you can expect some pain and discomfort. Why? Because it's going to change you. Our Father in heaven, thank you for the word of life that you've given us. Build that word in us. Change us and make us into your purpose and your image. And Lord, we'll be grateful for that kindness to us to deliver us from ourselves and from the world that we might, dear Lord, have life eternal. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen.